I want to share part of my story, which began 12 years ago. I was in my first year of an MBA program. I had two small children at home, and I had just given birth to and buried our third child, a little girl named Mercy Joan. She lived for only eight days. It was a really hard time in my life. I was someone who was used to getting so much done. I was efficient. I worked hard. And yet, in this time of grief, I knew that I was not okay. I needed a lot of help at work and in life. In fact, this was a picture that my three-year-old daughter drew of me at the time. She said, "Look, Mama, it's you." And even as I look at it, I think, "Yes, that's true. That's how I felt at the time." And here I was in this expensive two-year program, entirely devoted to training and elevating the next generation of managers, and we weren't spending five minutes of a single class session over two years. Talking about how we manage people in the midst of their disruptive life events or our own, and I know maybe you're sitting there and you're like, "I have my drink, I have my dress." I did not think that we would start talking about dead babies at the beginning of this session, but here's the problem: it's never the right time to talk about the hard things that happen. And so, all too often, we don't talk about them at all. We hope for the best. I talk with managers around the world, and they say they feel overwhelmed and under-equipped in knowing how to help their people through disruptive life events. And I know, even as I share mine, there's something that comes to mind for each one of you. Something that you've lived through over the last few years: pandemic, earthquake, people getting old, relationships falling apart. It's happened to you. It's happened to your people. And these things are difficult, but they're also opportunities. Opportunities. To really differentiate our businesses, to show that we truly are places that elevate the whole person. Even out in the hall, it says empathy up on the wall. But what does that look like? A recent study showed that 60 percent of managers quit or fail in their first two years. And you've seen it again and again. The reason that they do is because of people skills. Can they support their people through hard times, or not? And the good news is, it is a skill. Yes, some people are naturally more gifted than others, but it's a skill, not just for HR. Sometimes we think of it that way, right? Oh, if I have a problem, I go to HR. It's not just for people leaders. This skill is for all of our managers. And even as we begin, it's worth noting: all of us, everyone in your company, is experiencing grief right now. And grief is oftentimes something we think of only with funerals. Funerals are for grief, but the definition actually of grief is when it is unrealized expectations. Things you think will go one way, and they go another way. That's grief. Have have any of us felt that way over the last few years? Yes, yes, all of us. And it's worth acknowledging, so we can have better tools for support. So, in our short time, this is what we'll talk about. Why does it matter? Does it actually affect the bottom line of your business? The answer is yes. 
it does. We'll talk about that. How do you get over obstacles that get in the way of empathy? And what are strategies and actions that you can take back to make a difference in your workplaces? I want to share with you at the very start a tool that is very helpful. I work with companies across industries, manufacturing, technology, banking. This is the number one most used tool that people take away. And it's, it's straightforward. It's a great way to start out all of your meetings from now on. I'll tell you how to do it, and then you can have a moment to do it. I want each of you to think about the energy that you're bringing tonight. And I want you to rate it like a stoplight. Green is you're here, you feel great, the food was great, you love the person you're sitting next to, you're feeling good. Yellow, you're here, but maybe you're only okay. And red, you're here, but the energy is difficult, it's hard for you right now. Okay? So you think about it, I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor and say, how are you feeling tonight? Are you red, yellow, or green? Go ahead. All right, everyone, welcome back. I'm going to have you, if you feel comfortable sharing, let's get a sense of the room. How many of you tonight, you are feeling green? Please raise your hand. I see you greens, thank you. How many of you are feeling yellow tonight? Some? Okay. Is there anyone here who is feeling red? Any reds? Okay, I want to note, did you see? There are only a few people who are brave enough to say that they feel red tonight. I do this all over the world. I know that half of you yellows, you're really red if you felt comfortable enough to say it. But it's hard, we don't feel like we can be anything less than ready to go at work. When someone asks you how you're doing at work, what do they expect to hear? Call it out. If I say, how are you doing? What should you say? Fine, I'm good, I'm great, I feel wonderful. But we all know there are not always days where you feel wonderful at work. Some days are hard, some days are difficult, and this tool will help you because you want to be able to get better information from your teams. It also helps you because sometimes people are quiet, sometimes they're sitting back, you don't know what they're thinking, and sometimes that has nothing to do with you. They got in a fight with their child, they got stuck in traffic, if you use this stoplight check-in, it gets you better information. You also can use it as a starting place. Sometimes people, we don't know how to talk about the things that happen outside of work. But if you are to say, I feel yellow right now because my son just had surgery, what that shows to the rest of your team is that it's okay to talk about these things at work. So it's very helpful using the stoplight check-in. How many of you have ever seen rowers out on the water? You've seen, yes? Yes, okay. I was a rower in college. I would do this out on the water. Everyone thinks that rowing began in the UK, but I was researching and actually, people have been rowing on the Bosphorus for many, many years, so I'm glad to be back in the birthplace of rowing. 
And when everything is like this, it's beautiful on the water, it's smooth, it's powerful, and everyone is adjusting to each other. They're making small movements that change the boat. We want to think that our workplaces are like this, right? Everything's smooth and efficient, no disruption on flat water. But the reality is, all too often, our workplaces look a little bit more like this, don't they? Ah, oh, something has happened. Someone's mother is sick, they have to go home. There has been an earthquake. There are all kinds of things that make work feel much more like this. And we can't keep rowing, we can't keep moving if our people are stuck like this. So what are our tools? How can we help them get closer back to this? It's not by ignoring the problem or just wishing it would go away. The numbers tell an important story. I was talking uh, over dinner with someone. I said, what is your biggest challenge right now in Turkey with your business? And he said, attracting and retaining talent. It's no different in Turkey than it is all around the world. Do you know, in a recent study, 82% of people said they would switch jobs for a place that cared more about them as a person. And I know you know this, you care about it. You are at the Great Place to Work conference. And yet, many times, we, we know that caring is a good thing, but we don't always know how to show it. What does that look like? We feel uncomfortable. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. And again, why empathy? It helps create unforgettable customer experiences. When you really care for the customer, when you give them excellent service. But we can't do that, we can't have our people do that if we aren't caring for them as our employees first. Our employees can't give it again and again if they don't get it from us. I want to tell you a story that illustrates a point about what empathy can look like. So I was 12 years old, I was sitting on the bus, I was waiting to leave my school, and there was this young man who ran in front of the bus. He got hit by a car, fell, he was injured on the sidewalk. None of us knew how to be helpful until the first responders, the paramedics, came. And they had this basic bag that helped. It helps no matter what situation you're in. Someone might need a doctor, they might need an ambulance, hospital. But a paramedic has basic tools to help. What we want to give you is basic tools to be helpful, no matter what your people are going through. You don't have to have every tool. You don't have to be a psychologist. You don't have to be a counselor. What you can have is some basic tools to be helpful. So, the question is, what is in your toolkit? What do you pick up to be helpful? And are the things you pick up, are they helping you the way they want, or should you pick up something else? Let me introduce you to four different ways of talking with people who are in pain. The first one, this is called Buck Up Bobby in English. It's, a, it's the response where if someone is going through a hard time, you say, you have to keep on working. There's no time for whining right now. Keep going. We don't talk about those things at work. These type of people, they're very good at getting things done. Have you ever worked for someone like this, maybe? Just keep on going, keep on... They're probably not in the room because they're probably not a great place to work. You can't keep doing this forever. You will exhaust your people. If you are prone to doing this, always pushing, always going, you have to remember, people can't keep going endlessly. We need rest in order to be productive. A good thing for Buck Up Bobbies is to be able to say, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm sorry you're going through it, before you jump right to pushing them. Buck up, Bobby. Next one. Fix it, Frank. 
or a fix-it Francine for a girl. This is very common for people who are in leadership positions. People who get things done, they solve problems. Have you ever told someone a problem and they just want to solve it? They say, oh, I know exactly what you should do. You should do this or you should do that. And you think, I don't want you to fix me. I want you just to listen. If you're someone who usually fixes things, here's an important question to ask. Ask people, do you want me to listen right now? Or do you want me to problem solve? That helps give you better information. People don't want to just be fixed. They will stop listening to you if you do this to them. Cheer up Cheryl. Always a smile, right? This person always wants to look on the bright side. You tell them something hard. My mother has cancer. And they say, oh, tomorrow is another day. You are so strong. You will be okay. All of these things. For me, when my daughter died, people would say, at least, at least you still have your other two children. It never makes you feel good. It makes you feel like people aren't listening, like they're not paying attention. If you go this way, remember, people don't need you to cheer them up. And for most of the hard things that happen, there are no magic words. There's nothing you say that makes it all better. Something that you should be able to say if any of these types. Just practice saying, I don't even know what to say right now, but I want to let you know that I care. Last one, commiserating Candace. This is someone that has their own hard story, right? You tell them, you say, you know what, I, I lost a cousin in the earthquake. And they say, I know exactly how you feel. I lost three people and a fourth, and it's been so difficult to have anyone come. And before you know it, they have taken the whole story. The spotlight has gone from on you to on them. I will do this a lot. I have to actually be very careful because I want to tell my story. But it takes away from really listening. So I have to think, stop talking, keep listening, keep listening. If you're like this, a really helpful question is to say, tell me more. Tell me more. It shows you're actually listening and caring. As we end our time, I want to give you a few really practical things to take away, especially for those of you who are people professionals, because I know you're dealing with this all the time. Take all the time you need. How many of you have said this at work? Take all the time you need. Yes? Take all the time you need. Take all the time you need. It's not true, is it? It's a lie. We can't give people all the time that they need. But what people know that is not actually true, instead of saying take all the time you need, tell them a specific amount of time that they really can have. I tell people often, say something like, for the next three days, don't check your phone, don't check your email. We'll get back together after that. That lets people know how much time they really do have instead of in this uncertainty of take all the time you need. Okay, another tip. We are communicating oftentimes on Zoom, right? We all know what it's like on Zoom. You have one screen here, one screen here, your phone down here. You're checking, checking everywhere. Everyone knows that you are checking another screen. It shows them that you are not listening. Give someone the gift of your attention. Nod when they share something. Make those little noises like, mm, uh-huh, ooh, ah. It shows that you care. How many of you have ever said, let me know how I can help? Just let me know how I can help. Again, people say this because it sounds good, but most people never follow up. They don't come back and say, oh yes, I need your help with this. Instead of saying, let me know how I can help, offer something specific. 
Let me bring you a meal. Can I fill your car up with gas? Can I be helpful in that way? That will help you be much more helpful. A final note. If someone has gone through something hard, it's really easy to think, yes, I'll follow up, I'll be in touch. Anything that is important shows up in our calendar. If someone has gone through something hard, make a note the first day, the first week, the first month. Remind yourself to follow up with them. I also keep a note in my calendar about special holidays that can help me remember to check in with people when it matters most. It doesn't have to be fancy. As we close out our time, I want you to think about one thing that you want to take back to your workplace. There have been a number of different suggestions. What's one thing that you want to take back? Go ahead and tell it to your neighbor. What's one thing that you want to take back? No, you have to tell it to your neighbor. What's the one thing? I want to end with a final story as you think about taking that one thing back. So there's a company, a tech company in the US and the power of empathy and doing this well. There was a woman I saw last year and she had had a very hard summer. She had been to hospital, her daughter had been to hospital, her husband was having health trouble, and her company did such a good job. They gave her time off, they called, they sent her flowers. And she said, it's the most powerful recruitment tool that I have. Whenever I tell people my story, about how my company has supported me. They say, I want to work there. Are they hiring? Tell me about how I can be a part of something that is that great. Empathy is a skill. We all can learn it. And it is at the foundation of making our workplaces truly great. Thank you.